<laughs> but suddenly it stopped. Uh, Professor Thomas Horn from Oklahoma City Community College present workshop for the workforce. I, I think it's very interesting because the population that coming to the university gradually is changing to not anymore reducing from freshmen from high school. Therefore, I think it's gonna be a great presentation that we are gonna learn from how to cope and then the redesign our presentation classes to meet the new audience or, or ongoing that coming to our uh, you know, institution. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Thomas, you can start. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, some of you may not be familiar with problem posing workshops. Um, those of you that are may not have ever participated um, in one quite like what we are going to um, participate in now. Um, you'll be asked during this session to actively participate and engage. Um, though passively viewing is perfectly acceptable um, and you're welcome to you know, pick it up and, and participate however you like. Um, you're asked to share your opinions um, and ideas with one another, another honestly throughout this session and respectfully. Um, you might be asked to support your decisions, what you share, your practices and or your opinions. Um, I think you'll be ready for that. <laughs> We're all professionals and used to doing that um, throughout our various roles. Um, there is no requirement to enable your microphone or camera you're not comfortable or able to, um, I'm sure we can all make those decisions as best, you know, our technology and other needs um, dictate. This, this session will give you the opportunity to utilize your 21st century skills and emotional intelligence might be the most important one. Um, it will give you the chance to stop your knee jerk reactions, perhaps, um, to hearing things you disagree with. Think more critically and to communicate more effectively, all while you know, sharing in a community of individuals who do the work you do and um, improving opportunities for our students, our institutions, and even ourselves. Um, before we workshop, I always like to establish mutual expectations. Um, as a facilitator, uh, I will mainly ask guiding questions um, and record our progress. Uh, I will try my best to not um, try to dictate or direct anything, just try to give some structure to what we're going to do. Um, as a resource to you, I'll answer, I'll give examples um, uh, if asked. Um, however, I'm always available to provide support. Um, in the final moments of our presentation, I do have resources to provide and share. And if we do not have time, I will ensure that they're provided to you. Um, there are no right or wrong answers throughout these types of sessions. And I wanna repeat that. There are no right or wrong answers. Um, this is time to be free with your thinking, which is sometimes not really um, encouraged uh, throughout um, our experiences, but I want to assure you that that is true here in this space. I only ask that you be respectful. And that's a word I repeat a lot. Um, when you agree, or disagree, which you're allowed to do, please be respectful. Um, next, this will last about 50 minutes um, and it might seem like it just flies by, hopefully. Hopefully, that's the, the hope throughout the session. Please stay the entire time if you wish to participate um, and turn off all cell phones um, and try not to be distracted by the email or the grading or any of the usual things that we get distracted by. I know that we all have a lot of people depending on us um, but this can be a respite from that um, and a time to truly engage and participate in what we're going to be participating in. Um, this can be sometimes difficult, but do your very best to be open. Um, truly listen to the ideas presented by others and measure them with as little bias as possible. Um, try to see the other side, no matter how different it is from your own. Um, Finally, these conversations are not designed so that we can all find the singular right answer um, or way, but to build a deeper understanding of the topic together. We may not always have answers and there might be several possible answers, but adopting a single problem posing stance 
gives us a unique opportunity to practice a process of critical reflection and action with other educators and organizers that is similar to the process we foster with our students and community members. Also, they serve to create a capacity with all of us here to apply these techniques and what we learn to our institutions and perhaps even other areas in our lives. Change, personal, educational, or social um, is an ongoing and difficult problem uh, process. Problem posing and not problem solving, which is usually what we try to rush to, um, nurtures that process and lets us have the luxury of sitting in it. Um, you might walk away from this experience with more questions, frustrations, or ideas. However, I hope that you'll feel comfortable voicing concerns either during the session or by contacting me afterwards, uh, especially with the ideas, um, and that you also share what you observe with people that could not make it here today. Before I go on, I want to pause and give a moment um, for anyone that has any questions to ask them. So what questions do you have for me at this moment? Um, I create modules online for um, our new employee orientation at UCO. And so I'm just curious how I can incorporate what we're learning today in that realm. So most of what we're going to focus on today is about barriers and opportunities as they go forward with micro-credentials um, and workshop, workforce development. Um, so a lot of this can apply to that because we're going to talk about um, preconceived notions and um, resources and all those types of things, and it's gonna be completely open-ended. So we're gonna have different columns about the different processes that you can go through and everyone's going to brainstorm and everyone here is a resource. So it's a team workshopping environment. So you'll have the freedom to contribute and brainstorm and use everyone here as a resource. Oh, so it, it's up to you, right? Awesome. That's the, the type of thing it is. So um, like I said, I'm a facilitator, everyone here is the resource and everyone here is able to bring and apply what they want. So hopefully a lot, um, but we shall see. It's up to you, it's your session. Uh, um, so um, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, yes it does. Yes, good. Anyone else? Because I have preconceived notions as well and I have an outline and structure, but if it goes a different direction because everyone here thinks it should, then I'm all for it and I can be flexible and pivot. So, um, all right, so let's, let's begin. Um, I'm gonna start off with two very brief, just give you a few seconds to respond, polls. Um, temperature checks, not the ones we're used to because of COVID now, but um, just some temperature checks to get experience, background information um, and see where we are. And then we'll move forward. Um, so the first, I'll launch now, and hopefully you'll see it and be able to respond to it. Take a few seconds and um, just get reaction, um, answer it, and once everybody's had time to respond, I will end it and publish it so that everyone can see the results. Okay, we'll take a few more seconds. Because I think it's, everyone has answered. Yeah, 100%, oh, nope. Yeah, okay. I'm, so I'm lost on where I'm supposed to be answering. The oh, it didn't oh. pop up for you? I just have to chat. It should have popped up on your screen. Um, like in front of you there, it just ended now. Um, but here we'll go. We'll go okay. to the next one, and it should, <laughs> yeah, it should have popped up right in front of your main Zoom window. Just mm -hmm. popped right up in front of it. Sometimes, if people don't have the feature enabled or they have it blocked by their institution, it might do it. Or if you don't have the latest update to Zoom, but I mean, if you didn't have the latest update, you shouldn't have been able to join this session. So, um, 
Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now, and we're going to go to the next. Um, and it's going to start us on our first step of the workshopping process. And it's about barriers. I really don't like that phrasing. You'll notice when we get into the Jamboard that I'll send you a link to here in a second. I kind of rephrase it and reframing, uh, reframe it because framing is important. Um, but for the purpose of this, and hopefully when it launches this time, you'll see it, Jill. Um, did you did it pop up for you this time? No, that's interesting. That's okay. Uh, it, is it a specific app that I should be? Yeah. No, it's in Zoom. It's native to Zoom. The poll just usually pops right up on your screen. Okay. Um, well, I'm the odd man out, so don't worry about it. Well, you can <laughs> respond to it in the chat. I'll ask you the question. What do you foresee as the number one barrier to workforce development where you are now? And the the um, you can answer just organically, but I'll give you the you know generic prompts that are here. Um, lack of resources, non-financial or comp compensatory, um, compensation for training and faculty, uh, staffing resources for career services and support, disparity in resources across institutions, lack of transparency and or uh, communication within the institutions, lack of transparency and or communication among institutions, lack of collaboration between all stakeholders, lack of holistic and well-executed plans that are also timely or other. And you can add that into the chat. I'll try to give comprehensive, it might be a little overwhelming, but, and if you don't see all of those options, you can scroll in the poll. So give a few more seconds so that all of you can answer. And then I will publish. So again, it's what do you foresee as the number one barrier to workforce development at whatever role you have, you serve. Um, so I'm gonna end it to take a few more seconds and respond. All right, so end the poll, share the results. So it looks like it's a three-way tie. Um, between staffing and resources, lack of collaboration between stakeholders and a lack of holistic well-executed plans. Alrighty, so next I'm going to share a link and hopefully it'll work. There, it works. And this link will pull up a GM board that we can collaborate on together. Um, it should look like this. Um, no, nope, that's not right. Well, it reverted. Um, I'm going to change it back to what I had before. No, that's fine. I'll just, it, barriers I don't like, but challenges are good. Um, so you'll notice as you join that it isn't enabled as of yet um, for you to join in and edit. Um, and I, I always have it by default that that is the case because um, a lot of the times people don't know how to, um, you know, fully utilize or they're not familiar with Jamboard. So I like to briefly go over um, some of the features. So we have these columns, um, you know, with generic titles here. And if we feel like when we're listing things off, um, we can, we need to change them. I can change them because I have control over these existing headings here. I've also put um, titles here. So as a group, do you think it would be easier and more organized for me as facilitator to type in what we've decided? Or would you like to create your own entries using the text field over here and putting in boxes? What do you think? Because we can do it either way. I just know sometimes people start putting sticky notes all over everything. Easier for you to add. Okay, it sounds good to me. Um, so I will just change it to edit. And that should hopefully allow everyone permission to edit. 
So um, now going away from the question that we asked earlier about barriers and thinking more about all the different challenges that we experience when it comes to workforce development. And earlier we were talking about um, micro-credentials, but we can talk about um, when you're doing trainings in your role, or um, if you're talking about your comp one class, which is what I teach in my field. Um, and it might help to discuss uh, context, right? Different things like that. Um, we have a heading here for field, like your specific field or area that you're in. There um, are specific challenges. For example, I work in English and arts and humanities in a division where trying to convince people that um, online education, um, micro-credentials, um, different types of not the traditional way of doing things in a rigid and set space are the future and we need to adapt and we need to be current um, is a very challenging thing to do, right? Um, so that would be a field specific um, Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Brad is correct. You might, because permissions were changed, you need to um, refresh your page for the permissions to update. I apologize. Um, so if you, um, if you have something like that, you might insert a box um, and type ideas and start adding them. Institutional, um, if we were, like we were talking about before, um, we're all siloed in our separate areas, so we don't have um, spaces or connections between uh, different divisions or co colleges um, or campuses or different things like that to have those um, conversations to work together, um, then that what might be something that you would list. Um, and community would be stakeholders. Right, um, we, we don't have the relationships built between our campus, which might be an island, and the people in the community um, who have the jobs, right, that we can build work, workplace or workforce um, relationships with. And if we do, um, we are assuming we know what their needs are instead of building the relationships and partnerships with them. Um, uh, process, right? Um, this could be as simple as not having um, the quick enough turnaround time to um, adapt and be as flexible as you know you think you need to be, or in that and that has nothing to do with like the policy or the procedure, but it could just be because you know of other things here: field, institutional, community, um, silos. Um, different things like that, because I know, I, I believe my uh, interim president, my institution has been working on changes that are coming and stuff like that and partnerships and everything to um, make it to where it is very flexible and stuff like that. So I know th those things have been discussed and everything, but process can be, you know, at every level or uh, any level. Um, so different things like that. Um, I know uh, we changed our spring break at OCCC um to two weeks and until halfway through the first eight weeks of the spring our human resources department didn't even know about it um so you know that that's a process issue right um and then other is just you know if it doesn't seem like it fits in any of these places where where could it go um so any of those um headings um start generating ideas and of course unmute um, communicate, talk, and I can take notes and add anything that, um, you know, if you feel like you want to sound it out, but this is a communication, um, you know, active participatory, participatory thing. So, and I get nervous and I'll just keep talking if you don't. So,
movement. That's exciting. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few really, really good ideas. And that one is a big one. <laughs> and, and still a lot more coming. Lots of, lots of sticky notes, which are a better idea, it seems like, from the bo text boxes that I was thinking of, because I didn't even think of the font, font size issue. See, preconceived ideas, and then everybody else has better ones. First to admit when I'm wrong. Um, Alrighty, so let's take a few more moments and because it looks like we're filling up and we got plenty to cover now. Um, and let's talk about um, or look over um, some of the issues that everyone's addressed. So we have higher education needs to work with workforce to understand the real skills that are needed. Um, oh, that, that awful mantra that's really common. This is the way we've always done it. I mean, honestly, sometimes that just seems like the reason why we shouldn't do it anymore. Um, incentive to come up with new processes and procedures, competitive pay to attract talent, um, campus silos, ability to meet as an institution to discuss questions, concerns, and ideas, right? And depending on the size of your institution, that can be an overwhelming process for sure, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen, right? Institutional needs to develop authentic relationships with local businesses in the same way that they attract and recruit student relationships, right? Um, uh, and, and not just when they need money or when they need something else, right? Because um, that's completely transparent. Work first learners need scholarships and other support, 
um, especially uh, now, right? I mean, they always need support and everything like that, but not enough credential talent within the state to fill open jobs, being more inclusive and less objective, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship for sure, definitely. I tell my students constantly, one of the most impactful things that I did um, as an undergraduate and a graduate student was um, working on experience while I was a student, having it graduating with work experience um, and um, not enough credential talent within the state to fill open jobs is exactly true. Um, Buy-in from the C-suite and workforce in the community. I'm gonna be completely honest. I have no idea what that means. Um, I mean, I know about buy-in from workforce in the community, but what is C-suite? I mean, the only thing I know about C-suite is like Creative Suite and Adobe. So um, is that what that means? Who wrote that one? Oh, is that someone in chat? Cabinet level decision makers. Well, there you go, Brad. See, that's why, it, well, okay. At least, at least you know what that means because see, I'm saying like, I'm thinking it's like Adobe, Adobe or something like that. Um, see, oh, okay. Yeah, all those, okay. That jargon. Um, being more inclusive and less objective. Yeah, okay. Um, add additional trainings and support. Um, collaborative calendars to highlight shared efforts for similar outcomes. Um, and some institutions do have that. You can share colleague calendars and you can see them view them. Higher ed and workforce partners need to collaborate to identify skills instead of traditional student learning outcomes that are academic, right? Um, making everything accessible to everyone, knowledge, skills, and time needed. Lack of short-term, perhaps temporary programs to meet emerging um, needs. Um, is there really, really learning going on? Um, and does it really matter if they can do this one little thing that they're training in? Um, and a lot of these um, overlap, right? They intersect. Um, a lot of us know these things. Um, they're not really, I mean, it might be misleading to have these separate columns, these different colors, right? Because we know a lot of the times they intersect. Um, and it's not, you know, a separate individual sticky note because um, it's a range, right? And it's a process. Um, so the next column that we have, or the next uh, Jamboard we have looks completely blank um, because we want to get away slightly from um, having all of these things, um, you know, in the same types of columns because we're going to talk about the harder part because a lot of the times it's easier to think about what's frustrating and what's challenging. And it's harder to think about um, solutions, right? <laughs> um, and these don't have column headings because um, they won't match, they won't be the same, right? Because a lot of the times the solutions um, aren't really um, in the same types of categories or even come from the same places as um, the challenges or opportunities that we have. Um, and a lot of the um, examples that everyone proposed have some um, very complex and long-term um, solutions. You can't build realistic, authentic um, relationships overnight. Uh, they take sometimes mending um, and, you know, investment. Um, but there are some things that you can start with um, and build on very quickly, right? Um, a lot of those issues that were uh, addressed on the first page um, start with something that I know um, the state regent stress and that it, uh, many, many institutions stress um, and actually follow through on, not that I, I didn't mean that to sound surprised, um, but like do follow through on um, and that's best practices, right? Um, and when it comes to um, workforce development and um, things like that, one of the things that's really a best practice is, um, you know, transparency. Um, is it um, portable? Is it relevant? Is it valid? And a lot of your challenges, a lot of your um, 
um, you know, barriers and everything like that, we're um, addressing things like that. So how do we um, specifically provide possible solutions to that explicitly for our institutions? Because remember, we're trying to leave this session with solutions that we can carry into our institutions and our workplaces. Um, and it might help to share more detail about exp explicitly what we meant, right? So if we want to start with, say, one specific one, what does somebody want to address from this list? And you can pipe up. It doesn't have to be in the chat or, you know, say. Um, the accessibility for the process, knowledge, skills, and time needed. Okay, so accessibility. Yeah, that's really important. And sometimes uh, a, a place where um, we seem to fall short, right? Because um, it can seem like a really daunting task. So when it comes to accessibility, especially with workforce development, right? So let's put that. Um, how do we how do we do accessibility? What are some possible solutions? And you can put sticky notes. You can tell me, and I can write it up. Everything that we do in the training should be accessible by the organization or the people attended the training. Mm -hmm. How can we make it more accessible to everyone? I'm a little that confused, I think, by the <clears throat> the intention of the comment here, because I I think we may confuse digital accessibility with the accessibility right. of the actual resource. Um, and Are we you talking know, things provided like by an institution or by an organization to its individuals to empower them to move forward. Are we talking about everyone should be aware that it's available? Are we talking about um, accessibility is in like ADA, like it should be accessible and fulfill like Title IX, or are we talking about like it should be, um, you know, something that um, allows in everyone despite their, you know, protected classes? Like, I mean, there's so many different things that people could take accessibility to mean. Um, what do we mean by that? Sorry, that was my comment. And so I can clarify what I meant by it was um, when thinking about training and things like that, um, just the ability to present content that is accessible to all audiences and that the person who prepares it and shares it has to have that knowledge and skills and ability to do those things in order for it to even be accessible at all. Um, and so the knowledge within the, the creator, basically. Right. So yeah, it would be, it would be having even training and how to pre present and provide materials that are accessible to people who, you know, making sure it's uh, run through something that analyzes it for screen reader compatibility. Um, you know, uh, it can be exported into formats that the people who are going to digest it, um, you know, prefer or need um, those types of things. Um, if you're talking about, you um, accessibility as in people in the community having access to it or knowing it exists, um, you can involve marketing, you can involve, you know, um, publishing it in avenues that are accessible by all stakeholders and communities, right? I mean, there's so many different meanings and, and, and elements to that, right? Um, task forces, right? Um, what about the organization director or manager, whoever send the people for training, they have mm -hmm. to have access to progress and achievement of their employee. Right. And evaluating it, right? Not right. just mandating and, and saying you have to do this and but providing support and resources. And um, because I mean, the, a lot of the times with accessibility uh, institutions, it's like, okay, you have to do this, um, but where's the, you know, follow up, the support, the, um, I know at um, multiple institutions, I know for a fact that UCO and at OCCC, we have multiple tools and multiple trainings that have been provided 
for accessibility. Um, we use Ally. I know UCO uses Ally as well for, for our courses and, and our materials. Um, I love Ally. I think it's amazing. Um, it, it provides like 12 different resources for screen reading and Beeline Reader and um, all kinds of different um, you know, materials like that. It's really interesting. It, it's accessible on student devices. It's, it's really interesting like that. Um, it, for instructors, it provides reports that tells you what percentage of your course is accessible and what needs attention. It's click through. It's very accessible for even te non-technology -technolo savvy instructors. Um, so, you know, there's training, there's the technology, there's the support, the, all of those steps. Um, and then there's letting people know that that exists because you have to have marketing to students to let them know how to use it. You have to have the resources for the students so that they know how um, to, um, you, you know, that it's available to them and, and that it's a good thing and that's for their um, accessibility and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's a, a lot of different moving parts um, and components. Um, But also being aware that the one mandate from one area is not everything, not the only thing that's going on in that student's life or in that faculty member's life, right? Um, because like we mentioned with silos earlier, um, I think sometimes working as a coordinator with faculty, um, one of the biggest things I have to bring to supervisors and let them know is yes, in academic affairs, we're having this push for this, but in student affairs and in student life and in various other campus areas, there are eight other projects going on. And there are some people that are involved in all of those. So they have six different things they're working on right now. Um, so we could have some awareness and communication between that. So again, it's the interconnectedness of all these things, right? Um, so yeah, immersive training, experience current trainings as perceived by those who use screen readers and other aids. That's really good. A lot of the times, I know when I was at UCO, they had the, the week where you could go and experience different things and it gave a whole new understanding for some people of why these are needed and, 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 and how assistive and helpful um, certain things could be. Um, so we've got a good grasp on this, you think, maybe? Anybody have any further clarification needed or further feedback for this area? Oh, I missed something in the chat, see, look at me. Maybe aligning all the infrastructure that everybody know what is going on. Uh, that way, registration, no admission, no, the organization, no, the instructor, no, all they be on the same page. Yeah, that's both um, um, good, a great idea. Yeah, any kind of centralization of information and dissemination of communication would be really beneficial. Um, as long as it's not another email, I think it's, it's probably a good, a good way to do it. Um, all right, so what, what's another um, idea you think? Because I think we might have enough time to cover one more, um, probably. Because it, Anybody? Go back here and maybe look back at. So we've got, you know, the lack of short term temporary programs to meet emerging needs, mentorship, right? Buy in from leadership. Not enough credentialed talent, right? More collaboration. What really stands out to any of you that contributed these ideas that you would want 
to workshop together with everyone and develop possible solutions to. Anyone? Looks like some of these go for need assessment. Yeah, definitely. Um, so solutions for Um, so let's just, let's do needs. Um, so fulfilling needs in the community, how do we ensure that we are meeting the true needs, right? There's a lot done by that now, currently in our state, like telling us what are the highest needs, um, Oh, that's a, that's a good one too, Melissa. Some way to give recognition to people who may have the experience and knowledge, but not the degree or certification due to time and cost restraints. Um, that's and that's that's a needs assessment as well, because um, it directly connects to um, the need to have qualified individuals in the workplace fulfilling the the gaps that we have, but we currently don't have um, those people supposedly. Um, and again, Brad says digital badging is a great solution for that, um, right? Because they can go in and they can quickly get those um, qualifications because all, all it, it's saying you have um, something that says you can fulfill um, an assessment that says that you have that skill. And if you ever have the skill, you can quickly get through it and, and, and show that you um, fulfilled those requirements. So um, that's perfect for under this column, right? So the solutions, I mean, that can be one of them, right? Um, digital badging. Um, and when we go back to the previous screen and it says, um, is, you know, one little thing, um, this one little thing, well, that's another solution here is to say, um, it might help to have a definition of what micro-credential is, right? Um, something that verifies, validates, and attests that specific skills or competencies have been achieved and are endorsed by an institution, right? Um, and this is also where it might come into handy to bring in those best practices where you talk about transparency, portability, stackability, um, pathways to earn credit to degree um, earning if that's a desire, but not necessarily a requirement, right? If, if what they want is just to verify that uh, ability, um, then they can do that, right? So um, exactly, like the sticky note that there says. Um, so we have this information um, and partnerships, Laura says. So we have all of this information both in the chat and in the sticky notes here um, for how do we assess needs which we do have a lot of resources from the state and from, um, and federally as well, but definitely within the state, which is local and immediately can connect students um, to employment. Um, and then we have something that's a solution um, and, the, and connecting them to the various chambers, right? Um, and community um, resources, right? Like the, um, development agencies um, and ensuring that those connections, right, can work together, right? Like um, multiple of the comments in the previous screen have said. So all of those working together and connecting the people that are doing this work. When I worked for a homeless youth organization, the first thing you do, um, oh, I apologize. Let me get that link for you. 
Um, and hopefully that's the right one still. Um, hopefully it's the same. Um, yep, yeah, okay. Um, when I worked with the homeless youth organization, everybody that got, gets involved, the first thing they think is somebody should be doing something about this, right? Because you're emotional and you see something and you just constantly think that. But then when you start getting involved, you realize there are a lot of people doing something about this situation. Um, they just don't communicate or share information because they're territorial or they think somebody's going to take something from them because they work off grant money or they work off of state money or federal money or whatever. Um, and sharing takes something away from them. Um, and what, when I started work with them, I said, you know, listen, we don't care. It, here's our information. We're just here to help people. Um, and we want to just fill in the gaps and connect things. Um, and it's amazing how many people are like, Oh, okay. Um, and, connecting those gaps and filling in those spaces. Um, so we weren't just replicating services and doing what everyone else was doing because there were so many people doing amazing work um, was what made a difference, right? You know, because we wanted to make a difference. That's what we were doing, what we were doing. Um, and I think that might be part of the solution um, is finding where the gaps are, um, identifying where the gaps are. So we can fill in the gaps, connect everyone, and try to break down the ownership issues, the, the, the protectiveness um, and territorialism, um, which is not gonna happen. I mean, you're never gonna get rid of it completely. Um, just like I tell my students about argument, you can't remove argument completely or persuasiveness completely from human writing or you know, anything like that. It's just always there. But what's the overall purpose? Our overall purpose is to help students, to connect them to what their goals are. Um, so maybe that's the goal, right? Um, and that's one of the solutions. Um, how, do we, how do we fill in gaps and identify them? So maybe that's one of the first steps you take is where are we having those gaps and how can we fill them? So, um, Yes, we need to create collaboration to avoid silo issues, which causes those gaps and causes lacks of communication. Um, what else? We got a few minutes left. Well, I've talked way too much, way more than I thought. And I try to have an outline so I don't talk over. Um, but I wanted to leave you with one final thing. Um, and that is a resources page where I always put um, my email address, which is also included on my profile, but I just wanted to make sure everyone had it um, there at the bottom. And just some resources about different things. Um, problem posing at work, popular educator, educator's guide, um, the American Council on Educators report on um, credentials um, and a link to OSHA's page on credentials because that was my preconceived notion on what I wanted to cover, but I always like going the direction that everybody else wants to discuss and talk about on their topics. But we ended up kind of there anyhow, didn't we? Um, and thank you all very much. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you so much for your time. Let's stop sharing.